This presentation is called, What is Bateman's Principle? So in this presentation, we're going to answer four questions. And our first question is, what is Bateman's Principle? Our second question is, what does Bateman's Principle predict about male-female differences? particularly differences in reproductive strategies. Our third question is why do we find fathers and grandmothers among humans? And it turns out that what we call fathers and grandmothers are evolutionary novelties that aren't found among the other African apes. And fourth, does human behavior fit Bateman's expectations? So to get started, let's go back to what Darwin called the power of female choice. So if females decide who they mate with, their choices can act as a powerful selective force. And this has come to be called intersexual selection. Darwin's most famous example of this is again the tale of the peacock which he presumed to be the outcome of the choices of the peahen. Now, Bateman was studying fruit flies, but his arguments are often generalized, so we're going to treat them in a generalized manner and relate them to humans. And his first observation was that reproductive costs diverge between the sexes. And this is really noticeable in humans. So human males produce very low-cost sperm that are tiny relative to the size of an egg and are produced in much greater quantities. And after conception, males play no role in pregnancy. And after delivery, they play no role in nursing. So the metabolic cost to a male of reproducing is very low whereas human females produce high-cost eggs that are much larger and less numerous than male sperm. After conception, females struggle through a nine-month pregnancy, and then there are several years of nursing, so the metabolic cost of reproduction is much higher for human females. Bateman's second observation was that the differentials in reproductive success can be much higher among males than among females. So potentially a single man could sire hundreds or thousands of children. And an example brought up recently by some genetic studies was the suggestion that Genghis Khan had had quite an extraordinary reproductive success whereas the differential among mothers is going to be considerably lower. So this is a photo of a Montana farm family in 1937 uh, with 14 children, and that's near the upper limit. Uh, my parents both grew up in towns as children where the largest family consisted of 18 children. So they were both uh, familiar with families of 18 children their own families had eight children, and big families were kind of the norm in the 1930s in the rural United States. But nonetheless, the difference between 0 and 18 is considerably less than the difference between 0 and 1,000. So Bateman's reasoning was that because males have low mating cost and higher reproductive potentials, males should work to maximize their matings, and this should lead to competition for access to females, or what's called intrasexual selection. And we gave an example here of male elephant seals battling it out uh, to sire pups. On the other hand, because females have such high mating cost and lower reproductive differentials, women should be choosy, and this was what Darwin's language suggested, and this then is what's called intersexual selection. Now, if we look at 
Reproduction among humans, again, there are several characteristics that make us distinctive, uh, several derived, evolved features of humans. And one is that human offspring are slow to develop and very high cost. And then we have to add to this shorter birth spacings. So human mothers can do what's called stacking of offspring. And we don't see that among the other apes. And together, these two things add up to human mothers needing help. So human mothers can produce more offspring, uh, more high cost offspring than they can care for effectively. And this raises the question, well, who is there to help mothers raise their offspring? There have been two basic hypotheses on this and both uh, likely have some grain of truth to them. The first points to the evolution of fatherhood. And so among the apes, again, humans are quite distinct in that some males provide substantial assistance uh, to their mate. And this has been taken to be related to the human propensity towards pair bonding. And in kinship systems, what's called bilateral affiliation, where there's an emphasis on bringing the families of the reproductive pair together. But there's something else that's distinctive about humans, and this is the long postmenopausal life of human females. And so the second hypothesis is that grandmothers evolved to help assist their daughters with the care of their grandchildren. And this too is tied to characteristics of human social organization, including the tendency towards alloparental care particularly by related women, uh, sisters and aunts and mothers, and the formation of matrilines. And those are multi-generational groupings of related women. Now we could easily explain human behavior or much more easily do so if it were less variable. And the term usually applied here is facultative Behavior is facultative when it varies in its expression depending upon the ecological circumstances. And human behaviors are for the most part enormously facultative. And that makes it quite difficult to set out clear and easy explanatory rules. So to illustrate that point, we're going to look at a recent study of the Mpimbwe of Tanzania uh, carried out by Monique Burgerhoff Mulder and this is reported in a recent paper uh, called Serial Monogamy as Polygyny or Polyandry. And what uh, Burgerhoff Mulder was questioning here was the universality of Bateman's principle. So among the Mpimbwe, there are sex differences in reproductive success, but they don't play out the way that we might expect from the reasoning of Bateman. Burgerhoff Moeller describes the Mpimbwe marriage system as serial monogamy, and Americans are very familiar with this. This is where you have one spouse at a time, but multiple spouses or the length of your life. And so she pursued the question of how fertility differed between men and women, and also how reproductive success differed. So we're going to define these terms, and it's important to keep the distinction clear. Fertility refers to how many live births result. So the male range among the Mpimbwe was from 0 to 17 with an average of 8.41 per man. And of course that average could hide really high individual variance with many men having no conceptions of live births and just a few men dominating most of them. The female range was from 0 to 15 births, so it was almost the same. And the average was 8.17 live births per woman, which again isn't that far from the male range. But these averages and ranges could hide really significant differences in reproductive success. But it turns out that that wasn't the case. So the most interesting thing that Burgerhoff Mulder found was that the distributions across men and women of live births were very similar. And here's a reconstruction of her data. The blue bars 
show how many men had zero uh, conceptions and how many women, the yellow bars show how many women had zero live births, and in both cases that's six. And then if we look at the general pattern, it's not that terribly different. But what was really interesting about this is that there was no statistical difference between the male and female pattern overall. And what that means is that those differences could as easily be explained as simply random variation uh, rather than some causally shaped difference between males and females. So what about reproductive success? So Bergerhoff Moeller defined reproductive success as how many children survive to age five. So fertility was simply how many live births occurred. Reproductive success is how many children were still alive at age five. The male range was from zero to 12 children with the average at 5.99. The female range was from 0 to 12 children, with the average at 6.14. So again, the range and the average for males and females is very similar, but again, that could hide significant differences, and then it could be just a few of the men who are producing most of the surviving children. But what's really interesting about this is that just as with fertility, the distributions were very similar and couldn't be sorted out from what might result from random chance. And then we get to the really interesting conclusion, which is that by looking at the number of marriages that men and women are involved in and then relating this to their reproductive success, Bergerhoff Mulder found that men failed to benefit from multiple marriages. So among the Mpembwe, for males, more partners did not equal higher reproductive success, contrary to Bateman's expectations. However, for Mpembwe women, those who married three or more times had greater reproductive success and produced more surviving offspring. So for Mpembwe females, more partners did equal higher reproductive success, and this result is also contrary to Bateman's expectations, so that Bergerhoff Moeller's study inverted uh, those findings. Thank you for listening.